everyone. Thank you guys for coming out. This is um, the economies of scaling software, and I'm Abdel Rimani. My Twitter handle is um, Polymathic uh, Coder. Um, I will be posting a link to the slides at the end of the presentation. Um, I guess if you follow me, you can um, get that before everybody else. Uh, this is a little bit about myself. I'm a platform architect at Just.me. I am um, a frequent speaker in a bunch of conferences. I mean, the Jacks of last year, Java One, or Dev. And I am a uh, open source advocate and a contributor. And uh, I've been pretty active in the community, um, leading a few of the um, Java users group and, uh, groups and such. Um, uh, that's my email. And um, I also make my slides from this talk and other talks available on SlideShare. Um, this is just um, tells you that you can do whatever you want with these slides and share them with other people and improve on them uh, if you would like to. Um, this is my first time giving this talk. Um, I was supposed to give it at the Java One Russia about like a month ago, but that didn't happen. But this is my very first time. Um, I would like your help to help me improve the quality of the, the, of the, the presentation. And if you go at the end of the talk to speakers, speakerscore.com um, slash jaxconf dash scalability, um, you'd be able to, um, I mean, you'll get this, uh, a PDF of the slides as well, and you'd be able to um, um, tell me how much uh, I sucked. Hopefully not. So let's go. Um, so what's up with the title? Um, I chose this uh, uh, title. Um, uh, relating to the, the concept in microeconomics of the economies of scale. And uh, the Wikipedia definition says that economies of scale are the cost advantage that enterprises obtain due to size. So pretty much often operation, operational efficiency is gre uh, greater with increasing scale. So the bigger you are, um, the bigger your organization um, is designed to be, the, the more efficient and the cheaper it becomes uh, to, um, um, and the, uh, the, to, to scale. Um, this slide is titled, The Line is Blurred. It was a time when only enterprise applications worried about this issue of scalability. I mean, if you're somebody who's at home, wants to, I mean, building a website to sell t-shirts, whatever it is, that, didn't, that wasn't an issue that you were concerned with. But the rise of social and mobile, it not only increased the internet traffic, but also created this breed of spoiled users that would ask questions like, I want to see the closest Moroccan restaurant to my current location on a map along with consumer ratings, and whether any of my friends has recently, have, have, uh, has recently checked in in the last 30 days. So these are really hard questions that take, that take up a lot of resources. So that sits, uh, set up the bar pretty high, and scalability all of a sudden became everyone's problem. So what is scalability? Um, the most common definition, if you go and look around online, you find that people would define scalability as the ability of a software to handle an increasing amount of load without performance degradation. I happen to have a few problems with, with, uh, with this definition. The first one is that it comes with the implication that we could scale these systems forever, that, we could, that a system for a system to be called scalable is a system that can sustain that scalability forever, um, which is absolutely not realistic because it fails to recognize that there are these external um, constraints that we have um, um, around us. The second one is that it fails to acknowledge that being scalable is very r relative to the specific uh, use case that we've at hand. And also, it does not take into an account two things. Um, that it's not about a system being able to handle the work all at once, but it's about the system's ability to evolve, to actually be able to evolve to handle the work. Um, so a bit of definition um, is one I put together. Uh, it would be more like the ability of an application to gracefully evolve within the constraints of, of its ecosystem in order to handle uh, the maximum potential amount of work without performance degradation. 
Uh, this is easier said than done. Everybody talks scalability this, scalability that. Um, turns out that it's just not like a button that you turn on and off. Um, you could literally build an application that is capable of supporting one million users, and you add one more new feature, and your application stops crashing at 500,000. So the approach that um, to look at sc uh, scalability differently, we could look at it in terms of what we call the bottlenecks. In the sense that scalability uh, is about relieving or managing these limitations or constraints that we, we call bottlenecks, again. And when we talk about bottlenecks in computing, we, we talk about the usual suspects. We talk about the CPU, we talk about the storage or I.O., and we talk about the network. And they're all kind of interrelated uh, with each other. So the rest of this talk is structured around these bottlenecks to make the case that one's uh, scalability needs or concerns uh, are, are to be addressed in this fashion as well. So let's talk about the CPU bottleneck. So nothing affects your CPU more than the instructions that it's summoned, summoned to execute. In other words, this is about the very code of your application. This is about how your application is written. So, first of all, how, what, is, what would like a scalable architecture um, look like? And to define architecture, the best definition that is out there is one of Martin Fowler's that defines it as things that people perceive as hard to change. And he wrote this very nice paper called Who Needs an Architect? This very short uh, PDF that is very much worth reading. So, but in other words, an architecture would be these decisions that you commit to and the ones that you are stuck with for the rest of, uh, of, of, of your life, for the life of the, of, of the software itself. So you might want to think twice um, before making these decisions. And when we make these decisions, we're talking about uh, the choice of the, of the technology, like choosing the right platform or choosing the right language or languages. Uh, the frameworks that you choose to go with, or their libraries. And also making the right abstractions, whether these abstractions are technical abstractions, or they are functional abstractions. Um, and to make sure that all technical abstractions are subordinate to the functional abstractions, and not the other way around. So a scalable architecture um, effectively uh, emerges from writing good, uh, writing good code. So what is writing good code? What does it mean? Uh, I mean, it means a lot. I mean, that's a whole different talk by itself. It means that you should think your algorithms uh, through and um, be very mindful of, of their complexity. It means that your design would need to be solid. It means that you need to understand the limitations of each one of the technologies that you're, uh, that you're using and leverage their strengths and, and, and weaknesses. And it means that you need to practice TDD and all of that kind of stuff and use a bunch of tools, I mean, et cetera. It's a whole different talk by itself. So I decided to add this slide, know your stuff. I mean, if um, put together like a, in like a few seconds a bunch of books that everyone, uh, or like everybody that calls himself software en uh, engineer should at least read twice. Uh, and the list is very long. So write good code. But we write good code when we do all that and we're really careful and very disciplined and we still end up with this. If you're wondering what the picture is, um, it's straight up from an article called The Fading Tradition of Making Cow Dunk Piles. And I included a link there for you so you can go on and read the article, it's, uh, the article for yourself. So we, we end up at the end of the day with a dunk pile, right? But it's still much better than this. Um, so, this, to tra 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 this, these slides will pretty much tell you that technical debt is a reality. No matter how disciplined or how good you are, because of time constraints, because of different factors, the availability of resources, you will end up with technical debt, um, one way or another. So, all these things that are quick and dirty, you know, that you're not really proud of, things that you want, you would have done differently or should have done differently and all of that kind of stuff. And after a while, it starts to smell. I mean, in the sense of code smells of uh, um, um, 
as uh, Martin Fowler calls them. But the bright side is that as, so, as, 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 as long as you recognize it as debt, as technical debt, you're, you're, as technical debt, you're, you're, you're on the good side. And as long as you keep track of it, and then you factor it. So for the fearless, you want to be wise and then think twice and actually and cut the right corners. And don't lock yourself out. And don't make technical debt as a part, a part of your archi uh, the architecture of the software that you're writing. I mean, you know you don't have time, and you can either do this or that. Make sure that you make the right call, and uh, don't make something that you're stuck with uh, forever. So this leads us to the first um, section, which is scaling up your application. So what is scaling up? When we say scaling up, we are talking about vertical scaling. That means that we are talking about a system with a single node, and it means that we are adding more computer, uh, computing resources to this particular node, simply getting a beefier machine. Uh, what, what scaling up your application um, is about, um, it is about writing code to harness the full power of the one node um, by uh, writing code that is parallel, or parallelism, which is writing concurrent code or uh, code that executes, uh, executes in a um, uh, concurrent way. So most of us, um, are used to writing this code that runs within web containers by extending one class or like another one that, um, that, that, that becomes uh, multi-threaded just by extending a particular class because we depend on, on, on these frameworks. But the reality is that sometimes that the complexity of your business logic would demand that you actually break down that business logic in smaller step, um, have to execute them in parallel, and then have to aggregate the data back to get, a result within, uh, to, to, get a, to get a result within a reasonable amount of time. If you actually go and execute this business logic in a sequ sequential fashion, it just becomes way too slow. So you need to break, in, break it down and then spawn a bunch of threads, uh, fork him and then join back to come up with, uh, with an answer. This is not easy. Uh, it often requires a synchronizing state if you have uh, state to synchronize, which is a nightmare. Nobody likes to do that. Um, so on the one machine, um, to move a little bit to and talk a little bit about the hardware, on the one machine, because of Moore's law, we have been um, reaping uh, or uh, gaining perform or realizing performance automatically. So you write a piece of code, and then you take it out of um, I mean, if it, in the, uh, you take out your WAR file and you deploy it on another Tomcat server that is on a bigger machine, and your code is faster, your code becomes faster, because there are more resources available, uh, uh, available for, uh, for, for the CPU, more memory or, or whatever. So but the problem is, uh, we experienced what is called the end of Moore, uh, Moore's law. That means that we just could not fit, um, could not build faster CPUs or faster cores anymore. So what we, end up, what we ended up with, we ended up creating um, uh, the one chip with like multiple cores in it. So if you actually want to take advantage of this, you actually need to sit down and write code um, that, is, that, 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 that can run actually on multi multiple co cores. The good news is that there are a lot of frameworks out there, libraries that makes this uh, easier for you. There's like fork join in Java 7, there's Akka and etc. So it makes it, there are these abstractions that, that you could take, um, uh, take advantage of. But this is easier said than done, because we still have a lot of challenges. The first one about it is all these like third parties and dependencies that we pull in, that are not uh, open source, but they are not written um, uh, to, to take advantage of, of the multi-core architecture. Uh, the other one is that synchronizing state is much, much harder, because we're not now worried about multiple threads within the one CPU. We're worried about multiple threads across uh, uh, multiple cores. You could either go mutable, uh, which is not always straightforward, uh, or, uh, or sometimes not even possible, or you can go functional. Because, and that's a completely different paradigm shift. And it's a steep learning curve. So it gets more interesting. Uh, you might think that actually throwing more cores um, at, at, at a, that would actually 
give you more performance. You'll, get, you'll realize more performance by just running your code in like 10 cores instead of two or like four. But the problem is um, Am, um, Amdahl's law tells you that you get to a certain point when you actually end up diminishing return. Literally, you speed up, speed up your application, you get to a point when no matter how many cores you add, you don't, your code just doesn't get any faster. So this is what scaling up the application is about. Now, scaling out this application. And when we say scale, scaling out, we talk about horizontal scaling, which means that we have a cluster or a distributed system, and then we scale it by adding more and more nodes. And what this implies is that we need to actually write code to harness the full power instead of the machine, that we need to actually write code to harness the full power of the cluster. So we're talking about a topology like this, that we have a typical cluster that has a number of identical application server nodes behind the load balancer. And I've got um, number and identical and load balancer in bold. So when we talk about a number in a, cl in a cluster, it depends actually of how many you actually need and you can afford. You can have a cluster of 100 nodes, you can have a cluster, a cluster of two nodes. Um, this brings out to the, um, the, uh, the topic of elastic scaling or auto scaling, uh, which uh, means that you actually, the number of the live nodes can actually very much depends on the load your application, your application uh, is under. And that new node would be provisioned if there is more node. And then the, um, it, it, the, the size of the cluster will shrink if you actually don't need that load anymore. And that's a, um, um, a typical uh, practice. And when we talk about identical, we, we, we mean that every single node, every single application node is cloned off a, an image file. They're identical. They're, 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 they have the exact same code base. And there are a lot of tools right there that would allow you to do so. You can use Chef, or you could use Puppet, or you could simply just use clone your code off of Amazon EC2 um, AMI images. And the last component, of, or major component of a cluster, is um, this load balancer, which means that we have load that is to be distributed evenly across this, uh, this cluster according to some, some kind of algorithm. Um, round robin is typically, you know, the standard, you know, configuration. So we're talking about something like this. We have all of these people over there, you know, behind a firewall. We have the load balancer and we have these nodes. Um, and then the requests go through the load balancer and they get routed to one of those machines. So in a cluster, one of the biggest challenges is actually to manage state across this cluster. And um, state session data, as an example, is managed differently depending on your needs. The first option is that session replication. It means that every time node A writes to the session, writes a, a piece of, of, uh, of data to the session, there is this um, framework of this piece of code that would actually go and replicate all that data for to in, in, in the rest of the nodes so that session data is available for them and it can be read. Uh, the second option is what is called session affinity or sticky session. In session, if, if you, we say that you have session affinity if actually the load balancer is actually more active and more aware of the source of the request and that the load balancer ensures that um, the request from client A will always be routed to server A. So he knows it's coming from this IP, IP and will always go to server A. That way, you can write to the session, and the next time you can like read from it, and you're in the exact same machine, and there is no need for replicating it across the cluster, which is a big, a big overhead. Uh, the problem with session affinity is that when the node dies, you lose that session data. So uh, it just you, you, you end up eventually being routed to a different server, and then you don't find your data over there. And this is, can be pretty bad if you're in, on Amazon.com and you just added something to your shopping cart and then you go and you refresh the page and it's gone, it's not there anymore. The other option that you have for managing state is the shared or distributed uh, session when actually session is stored, the session is stored in a centralized location 
or at least to you it is on a centralized location. It might be in like a storage that is um, somewhere else, like memcache or anything else, or it might be that it's actually managed by a piece of software that actually goes and allows you to look at memory or look at um, the uh, of, of the cluster as just like one piece of, uh, of, uh, of one unit of storage. So do yourself a favor and go stateless because managing a session is just a nightmare across a cluster. So just don't use it at all and go stateless. Any, and, then, and, and that way any server would do. It doesn't really matter where the, or to where the load balancer will send the request and you can just do your business because you're not really depending on uh, some state or expecting some state that you had written before. So now we talked about parallelism on the one node, which most of you are familiar with. Now we want to talk about parallelism, uh, parallelism across the cluster, right? So to be able to harness the power of the cluster, there are all these operations that are just maybe um, deal with a lot of data or like too much data or uh, for like the one node to handle. We could leverage technologies like MapReduce, um, Hadoop is the one of uh, um, the implementation, which is a programming model that processes data sets in parallel and, and um, or, or executes uh, distributed algorithms uh, on a cluster. So other concepts in relation to scaling out your application that you might want to get yourself familiar with and assess whether you actually need them or not is the uh, distributed lock managers of a DLM when actually you need synchronization of like shared resources across the cluster. There was like um, a paper, I think, um, um, by, um, um, by Google, but the Google Chubby, you could use Zookeeper, and there was like an array, um, I mean, a list of other technologies. And also, you're gonna have to actually worry about distributed transactions. Uh, HTTPS comes up. Um, as, uh, uh, all the time, what, what would you do uh, to these HTTPS sessions? Uh, you have, you could, uh, your, your options is either to end the HTTPS session on the uh, load balancer or to actually use uh, wildcard um, SSL certificates that would allow um, in, in any node pretty much to, um, um, to do the handshakes. And also you want to actually consider leveraging probabilistic data structures and algorithms, things like Bloom filters and uh, uh, quotient filter, uh, filters and, and uh, et cetera. And uh, the, these things, I mean, if you do a quick Wikipedia search on a Bloom filter, these are just like little simple algorithms that would answer the question whether um, a particular piece of data is a part of a set or not. So it would, this would be instead of actually looking up something in the database, it would be just um, running it through a filter uh, in memory and be able to get you answer an uh, answer right right away. So deployment right now. Um, so a typical deployment environment right here in bigger or uh, bigger organization. Um, um, you will have multiple environment. Your dev environment, test and stage and production. I'm sure all of you is familiar with this. Uh, a lot of, um, you, you need to actually have some kind of uh, automatic configuration tool as well. And uh, you, as, uh, you, uh, you, you should probably like practice something like a continuous uh, delivery, which is out of the scope of this presentation, uh, which it means that you're all, uh, your developers are writing production code every day and you're deploying as often as possible uh, to, um, um, to, to, to production and running um, a bunch of tests to do that. Um, in deployment, you want to leverage the cloud. I mean, you can, there are different degrees of, um, of cloud computing. You could just run your own cluster of uh, EC2 instances and uh, put them behind the load balancer. They will be using the infrastructure of a, of, as, a server, as a service. Or you could throw in your war as a, as a PaaS and not have to worry about that at all. So this is um, dealing with the CPU bottleneck, which is just starting to actually write your applications differently in a different way and starting to take advantage of all of these technologies. So the storage bo bottleneck, or the I.O., is the most probably significant. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. So the first part I want to talk about is the persistent store. 
uh, we, there was a time when actually we didn't have to think of what data store, what type of data store we want to use. The answer, the obvious answer, the de facto answer was, oh yeah, let's, let's use MySQL, let's, let's use Oracle, it was the RDBMS model, uh, which is a model that has a schema that guarantees data integrity. Uh, your data is normalized, you have asset transactions, uh, your data is stored in a way that is not biased towards any kind of query pattern. Um, and um, it has this very nice flexible query language that we can use later to query it however we want, called uh, SQL. The problem is that our data sets, as our data sets grow, we started actually scaling vertically. And we mentioned the, the actual database system. So we bought beefier machines, which is not cheap at all, it was expensive. Uh, we spend a lot of time doing uh, database tunings, uh, doing query optimizations, creating materialized views and all of these things. And we started denormalizing. And uh, the data, we keep, we keep hoarding data. Um, and it, to the point that we hit the limit of the one machine. We just couldn't do anything to, to make it better anymore. Um, so we attempted to actually scale out the RDBMS system by actually running relational uh, databases on a cluster. And we have these architectures, these master-slave architectures. We started doing data sharding. When you actually take your data set and then you shard it by some kind of key, like employees from A to F are on node one, and from F to Z are in node two, etc. But we failed. That did not work. So why is that? This is because of Eric Brewer's cap theorem of distributed systems that literally tells you that you can only have two out of the three. You could either have consistent out of the three, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Partition tolerance simply means that you're running in a, in a cluster that is um, um, fault tolerant. So the relational model is actually designed to favor CA, to favor consistency, um, and, uh, to guarantee acidity of transactions and all that, and availability. You want the database to be available all the time. So by default, or by um, the cap theorem, you just cannot scale it horizontally. So this gave the birth of of an, caused an explosion of a wide range of specialized data stores that we call the NoSQL movement, whose goal is to address these issues. And the biggest issues is to be able to run your data store within, like, uh, within a cluster, mostly. Uh, it's a wide variety, it's out of the scope of this uh, presentation, but some of them are, some of them are key value st uh, data stores of uh, column-based, some of them are document-based, and we have also um, graph uh, uh, data stores, which, are, which are, are not actually designed to run, um, to run on a cluster, but they actually look at the data differently and they allow you to um, um, uh, query them like a, like a graph. These are a bunch of uh, solutions like out there. This is again out of the scope of this presentation. But here comes the concept after, I mean, this is fairly pretty new. Uh, so then we talk about uh, polyglot persistence. And what polyglot persistence is, um, is, is the idea that is based on acknowledging that the complexity of these applications that we are building uh, would uh, cause different ways of querying the data and will cause us to deal with different data altogether. And the fact that you could actually fit these different data and different query patterns in one model and expect no problem is just absurd. So the solution is polyglot persistent, which is just leverage, lever, use more than one data store and uh, lever, uh, leverage them uh, within your application you know, store graph-like data in a graph database and store uh, you know, data that is highly relational, or that is uh, designed to be reporting, uh, reporting in like a MySQL, uh, MySQL database um, or a relational database, and simply um, have your application query it from the different data stores and aggregate it and construct this model to, and then pass it along uh, through your, uh, your business logic. Here comes the important of things like parallelism, you know, and writing code that is concurrent, uh, writing good code that is concurrent uh, versus actually sequential processing. 
So for more details, I gave, I think, a NoSQL talk last year at the JAX uh, 2012. I think it's available uh, on YouTube. Uh, that's the bit.ly URL, and if you just Google the rise of NoSQL and polyglot persistence, uh, just go to the one that is from the JAX conference. I think there might be two instances in there. So the second thing that we want to talk about uh, after the persistent storage is caching. And caching is simply just a large, simple key value data structure. So instead of us incurring that overhead of data retrieval or incurring that overhead of comp uh, computing um, something, um, every time you want to, every time for every single, uh, every single request, we simply cache that and we make that available. We cache it in memory and we, we make that available or somewhere and we make it available. So since we, cache, we can't cache everything, this is not a dump of data in memory. There are different caches, can be configured to use multiple algorithms. You know, are you the least recently used for, uh, is to be cached or the most recently used? It depends on your specific use case. So use caching aggressively if you want to scale as much as you can, flat out. So, but what to cache? I mean, again, frequently access data like your session data, for example. If you have a feed in your application, you might want to consider like caching that one way or another or cache things that take a long time to, uh, uh, to, to compute. So where to cache? You could cache on disk, the file system, of course. It's a terrible idea. It's very slow and sequential. Or you can cache in a, in a database, um, which is a little bit better, um, because data is actually arranged in data structures that are designed for efficient access. And they have, uh, you can have, uh, have indices and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's generally a terrible idea, even if you're running on like SSDs. But the reason why I mentioned it is that we can talk about these operations that, to, uh, that, that take a long time to compute. And this is, this, it might take two hours or three hours to compute. You just take the result and then you put it like as a file. That's like much, much better than actually um, going through, through the whole thing. Or you can actually cache in memory fast. You get random access, but I mean, it's uh, volatile. Or you can have something in between, like using a NoSQL database like Redis uh, as a persistent uh, cache. So there are multiple types of caches. There are like local caches that are local to the particular instance or the particular um, um, server that you're dealing with. There are like cache, uh, replicated caches, which is the same way uh, that, uh, that, that, that we mentioned before, managing a replicated sh session in the cluster, that you're right. Um, a, a bit of, of data to um, the cache in node A and it eventually get replicated uh, throughout the cluster. There are distributed caches when actually the system starts viewing uh, or the programmer um, starts viewing the cache uh, that is distributed across many, many nodes so it's just like one uh, unit of storage. And there are like clustered caches which is completely different caching servers that are like clustered like um, memcache for example um, servers. So what is this caching, you know, how to cache? So most caches implement a very simple interface. It's extremely simple. But the, the rule of thumb is always attempt to get from the cache first uh, using a key. So since it's just like a map in memory, you just say, get me this key. And you get something in return. You get your data in return. If it's a hit, that means if it's in the cache, then you save yourself the overhead of actually having to look this stuff up in a database. And if it's a miss, then it's okay. I mean, you just actually have to go back to the database and then do your retrieval and actually incur that overhead. And uh, it might be good for you to actually stick it back in the cache. So next time you look up, you get, you get a hit instead of, uh, in, instead of a miss. When you update a particular resource, you can actually evict it from the cache. Uh, you can assign a time to live when you actually put, say, just keep this in the cache for five seconds or two seconds. And there are different scenarios where that actually becomes useful. And there are many common operations. It's a very simple interface. So in caching, there are certain patterns that you might want to be, um, um, uh, uh, that you want to uh, be aware of. The first one is actually caching query results. When you have this frequent query that you hit the database with, the select everything from table A, for example, and you limit of 10 rows, the way you would cache this is you take the actual query itself, you hash it, and then you use that as the key 
So the next time somebody comes with a query, you take that hash and then you look it up in the cache and then you return the result. It's very simple. But uh, it becomes quite interesting when actually dealing with parameterized queries. If you have select um, star employees where ID is 125, that hash of like is not the same as select employee where hash is 13, whatever that is, right? So the way you would do that is actually to hash the actual query and then you hash the parameter values. So, um, and you'll end up with eventually multiple instances depending on those, of those parameters, but that would be like uh, probably the best way to do it. You can actually use hash to do a method of function memoization when we're not dealing with data access. That means a method that computes resources and it has like parameters. You take the method name instead of the actual query and you hash it and you stick it in the cache. So the next time that method is called, you actually go and you look up and see um, if, if you've already done that before, if it's a hit, and then you return the result without actually executing the code. So it's like a big if statement uh, that, that, is, that, that encloses, or encloses the memoize the method. Or you can actually cache object, and this is a different approach. When you actually take an entire object graph, you serialize it, one way or another, and you take the identity of that particular object and you just stick it in the cache. Um, the ID of an employee, for example. And every time you look at an employee, um, you look up employee number one, two, three, four, you just go to the cache and give me whatever's key that's one, two, three, four, and you can get um, the empl employee you're looking for. So another caching pattern is when you're actually dealing with time series data sets. That means data sets that actually um, frequently updating with time, like an actually the top of a feed or a Twitter feed or a stream of messages, whatever it is. So a lot of people are pretty much satisfied with data that is not real time, data that is pseudo real time, not near real time. I mean, people are fine with, I put a tweet, I add a tweet, and nobody would be able to see it for like a second or like two seconds. So you would use caching in this fashion to actually throttle access to this particular resource in the sense that you would add, cache, cache the latest page of the feed and you say, you key it as feed for example, or with like a particular key and say, leave it in the cache for like five seconds. So everybody who hits the cache within the five seconds is going to get you know, that copy and you never make a, you never make a query to the database but then that thing will just eventually expire and go away after five seconds, then you make the second query, right? So you'll be making a query per T time, and that's, and that's, and that's up to you, um, up to the, uh, the TTL time that you actually decided to set. So it's not trouble-free. <laughs> you really got to be very careful. Um, and actually, most importantly, actually profile your code to actually assess whether you actually need cache to begin with. You don't want to litter your code with cache here, cache here, cache here, and go all crazy if you actually don't need it or you don't have any significant performance gain. So you really want to be careful. Um, also, stale data might actually bite you hard. When there is an incoherence, so there is an inconsistency between the actual data in the database, which is the truth, and the actual cache in front of it that you use. Uh, this might easily, easily happen um, in two cases. It's assumed that you actually um, li would like to look up, you cache these objects, you would like to look up these employees by their last name, and you would like to look them up by their ID as well. So when you, you, and you actually evict the ID one, two, three, but you forget the object uh, with the last name um, in the cache. So you have like two inconsistent copies uh, that are like just like sitting there. So, um, and so you really want to be careful there. Also, stale uh, um, nested aggregates. Employee has a bunch of children, and then you take this employee, and you one, two, three, you stick him in the cache, and he has three kids, whatever it is. And that data actually ended up, would end up being changed in the database. He's um, uh, dependent on his children's information, but it's stale on, on the cache. Um, also, the network overhead of misses might actually overweight the performance gain um, of, uh, that, that, you get from, from, that you get from the hits. If you're missing, 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 every time you go and you look up in the cache and you miss, you miss, you miss, 
that's actually time that you actually spend going to the cache and trying to get retrieve that information. So you really be mindful of that. If you're missing more than you're hitting, you're just incurring um, um, that, that, that latency. Um, and you wanna, that, that's where it would actually would make you question what, what type of cache algorithms you need or whether you need like caching at all. Also consider writing and updating the cache when you actually write to the data store. So consider having some happening around some kind, of, some kind of transaction if that fits your need to actually every time you update something where you put it on the data store, you stick it in the cache if you actually know that you will retrieve it, uh, you tr retrieve it later. Uh, featured solutions right there if you want to explore is EH cache, memcache, you know, coherence, uh, Redis, which is actually a, not considered to be a cache because it's persistent. A persistent NoSQL data store, which is just like a large map. Uh, support a lot of nice things like built-in data structures like sets and lists and it has like very intelligent uh, keys and namespaces. Uh, if you're interested, you can come and talk to me after the talk. So the last bottleneck that we would like to talk about is the network. We talked about the CPU and how you actually need to write your application to maximize and harness, harness the full power of the one node, how you actually can write your code and use technologies to actually harness the power of the entire cluster. We talked about the data store, and we talked about the different options, the different data stores that you can, uh, you can use and can even like use more than one and be a uh, polyglot. And we talked about using caching, how it's a good thing to use aggressively. Now the last thing is actually dealing with the network bottleneck. Asynchronous processing. So, some often we would have these resource intensive tasks that are not practical to handle during an HTTP um, request window. You have this piece of code that takes 10 seconds to, to run. You, you couldn't do anything about it. You, you know, parallel process it, you just, it just takes that much time. Right? You're depending on some third party or whatever, it isn't takes that, uh, that much time. So, uh, so this is where syn asynchronous processing would be a good um, um, use case for. Um, sy being synchronous is overused and it's not necessary most of the time. Sometimes you look at your request, you look at your API and you really say, well, this one does not really need to be synchronous. Um, so you really give it like, uh, give, it, give, it, give, it, give it a thought. We were talking about asynchronous processing, we're talking about different patterns. The first one is actually pseudo-synchronous processing. Uh, we're talking about a flow as follows. When you actually pre-process data or do operations in advance, like a nightly job, whatever it is. So that way, the next time somebody hits you with a request, asking for the result of that particular application, or requesting that data, you just respond synchronously and you give him this pre-processed uh, data. So uh, this is cool, but sometimes it's not possible when you're actually dealing with dynamic dynamic content and you're allowing people to pass you different, uh, different, um, uh, different parameters, et cetera. The second pattern is actually true asynchronous processing. And the flow is as follows. The request comes in uh, or for, for the data for or like to perform a particular uh, application and your server immediately acknowledges it. And by acknowledging, we mean that you actually return an HTTP um, 201 accepted status code right away, hey, I acknowledge it, I got your request. And you actually allow, do the processing at your own convenience. You just like throw in um, some worker, th a worker thread to take care of that or like push it to some kind of job queue. And you do that processing and you can give the, uh, the user the courtesy and allow him to actually go and check for progress. This would be like you placing an order in amazon.com and they tell you, all right, your order, uh, order has been placed and you can go and say, oh, processing, shipping, shipped. You can go every once in a while and then check on, 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 that, on, that, on, that, on, that, on the, on the status of your, uh, of your order versus actually clicking and waiting for two days until they actually ship you or like uh, two days until you actually get the product delivered, if that's even possible, uh, which is not a uh, timeout. Um, so, um, this is what a true asynchronous processing is. There are a bunch of techniques and technologies that would like um, that you could leverage. 
Some of these have job, work, task queues, they have different names for them. Uh, JMS, AMQPs, to different implementations and servers out there, AWS SQ and such. And uh, which simply takes, you take a particular, um, you know, you acknowledge the request and you take that job and you push it into a queue and you have a bunch of workers, you know, that actually pull from that queue and then do the processing um, later. So you immediately just like push it over there. Um, um, so the second one is actually task scheduling. You could leverage a bunch of libraries. When you actually periodically, you'll have all these jobs that periodically would go and pull from these queues every hour or every two hours, whatever it is, and you'd have some kind of coordination over there. And there's also like batch processing. If you look at your application and you're all asynchronous and you think that um, it's just be uh, good and more efficient to actually ship orders all at once, so you have a shipping queue and then you just like batch like 10 at once and then you're, uh, you, 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 you move on. So the, speaking of network, the network bottleneck, addressing the network bottleneck, the next thing after asynchronous processing and after being asynchronous as much as you can um, um, because that makes you more available, we want to talk about this um, CDN. And what CDNs are for like everybody else, or everybody who's on the web, we have this static content that our, app, that, is, that our application would serve to these users. We're talking about videos and audio files, wherever it is, that a lot of other will actually go and put in the web inf directory if you're um, um, running like a, a Java application or would actually just make it available um, anywhere else other than the, you know, outside of the web inf, wherever you want to make it available. Uh, and we have these web objects that are static. We have this HTML, we have these JavaScript files, we have CSS, and we have, uh, all, we have um, um, all, 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 all these things. Do not serve this through your application server. Just simply don't. Because somebody requests your one page, your index page, and your index page includes 10, two CSS files and 10 JavaScripts, and every single, and that just like swamps your server and keeps it busy every time somebody goes and hits your index page. It's just unnecessary. Your server, your application server there is there to execute um, and, and, and be, able to, uh, be able to respond to users at all time and execute business logic. Not actually be worried about pulling pictures or serving uh, binary to play uh, your intro video, whatever it is. And this is why we would use a CDN4. And what these CDNs are, it's just a large distributed system of servers deployed in multiple data centers across the internet, they're like all over the place, um, that you actually pay for. Akamai, uh, AWS, um, um, uh, cloud front. It's, uh, front. it's just like a piece of storage. Instead of storing your pictures on your server, you put them in a, in a, in a CDN, and you can just like start um, pulling that data uh, from there. Not trouble free, of course. Uh, the gotchas, uh, when you first deal with these CDNs, uh, is versioning and caching, right? So assume that you have like a script file named the uh, script.js and you deploy it in a, in a CDN, and it's perfect because you know that this file is available everywhere in the world in these edge nodes. The Japanese people are requesting that script.js, they're going to get it from the closest server to them, which is the server in Japan. The, Amer the American ones are going to get it in the, from the American node, and it's perfect. It's available everywhere, and it's great. So what CDN does, it just takes script.js and then puts all these copies on all these like edge nodes uh, for, to, for them to be served and be made uh, available. Also, every time the, your Japanese client is going to go to the Japanese edge node, and he's going to go and cache in his local browser cache script.js. So browser, most browsers do that. Um, so you'll end up with uh, another uh, layer of redundancy. So the problem is that when you actually go and fix a bug in script.js and you actually update it, that new content will never be able to be replicated or propagated propagate throughout, uh, um, throughout the nodes or the edge nodes of your um, CDN because the file is named the same. You, put, you deploy a new script.js and all of these nodes, look at it, oh, I already have script.js, not realizing that they have the older, uh, older version, right? 
So what you can do and what a lot of CDNs will allow you is you actually will allow you to invalidate script.js and all of these nodes, and it takes a while, so they can get the new copy automatically. Now you still have another problem, which is all of these clients that refuse to go and get the newer version because they think they have it. They think they have script, uh, script.js, not realizing they still have the old, uh, older version. It sucks. So how do you deal with this, with all this dirty state going out of control? Um, I mean, how could you solve the problem? You could simply append or actually versionize these files or these static script files by actually changing their name. Instead of script-vn-v1.js, when you update or fix the bug, you rev up the version, you have script-v2.js. And all of a sudden, you have a compl completely different URI that the edge nodes would actually realize, oh, this is a new file, let me pull it. And um, all of these clients actually say, oh, this is a new file, it's not the old script v1.js that I have. As simple as that. Uh, you could also leverage or use set up the HTTP caching headers properly. Um, or force the invalidation of, the of a particular file on all edge nodes, and you could do whatever you want. I mean, it depends on what CDN you use, and they have like different ways of uh, configuring things. The last thing I want to talk about to address the network bo bottleneck is the CDN. It's uh, not the CDN, it's the DNS. So what DNS is, everybody knows it, the domain naming service. Um, what we don't realize is that when you register a new name in the registrar, they give you your own www.superman.com. You know, it's yours. Um, they give you this DNS service for, a server for, a service for free. Right? The problem with that is that if you want to write systems that actually scale, you're going to have billions of requests actually hitting that DNS and asking, hey, give me the IP of www.superman.com and they're going to get overwhelmed, you're going to get throttles, and you're going to slow down you know, a great deal. So you won't be able to scale. So what you want to do is actually, consider starting paying for a bit of service, consider using solutions like AWS Route 53 or uh, Ultra DNS that actually will charge you a price for like a fee, but they have the capability of um, handling the large amount of requests that would allow you to, actually to, to scale. Because you sit there and you're like, my, why is my server so not responsive? Why is it slow? What's happening? And it's actually not you. It's actually the DNS that you are using, which is most likely the one, the free one that comes with the registrar. So the next section is about qualifying uh, scalability. You know, actually measuring, knowing what scalability is, and which is like just a few slides, which is like very short, because we went through addressing it, how we can uh, write scalable applications and address the three bottlenecks you know, differently by leveraging technologies or writing our code differently and all that kind of stuff. Now let's qualify this scalability. So um, talking about instrumentation, um, make sure that you bake in instrumentation in, in the code, into the code early. That means a bit or a piece of, of code that actually simply sends you know, data, how long a particular request uh, takes. Um, you know, uh, Yammer metrics, Yammer metrics, for example, is an example of that. You could literally hit that servlet, or it's just like a filter servlet that would tell you how long particular requests, are, uh, requests, uh, requests take. Uh, make sure you have monitoring. We we'll monitor your application health or cluster health, uh, the individual nodes down to the JVM metrics or the system resources. And you track uh, key, uh, KPIs or pr uh, performance KPIs. The number of requests uh, handled stands out, the throughput and the latency, and also something called the AppDex index, which is a standard that could give you a number that tells you whether your users are satisfied or not, literally, or how many of your users got pissed off because they waited too long and, and stuff. You can Wikipedia the uh, AppDex index. Um, logs as well. You really want to, all this throughout the clusters, you want to make sure that all your logs get channeled to some kind of data store so you can actually go and analyze them later. Testing, make sure you load tests. Um, these are a bunch of products that would actually help you out with that. You know, Ganglia for monitoring, Nagios, New Relic, uh, Gomez for performance monitoring, JMeter and Grinder for uh, load testing um, and such. 
disaster recovery. You know, it happens. Sometimes, you know, you wake up in the morning and nothing works. So uh, you want to be ready for this when disaster hits. Your goal is actually to build, to begin with a full tolerance system. That's why you're running a, on, on, a, on, on a cluster. That's why you use, so you depend on certain technologies and make those choices. But in the case of, uh, of, a, of a disaster, you want to recover and you restore um, as, uh, the, your service as soon as possible. Um, you want to have what is called a DRP or a disaster recovery plan. And you want to actually do drills. Literally sit down and say, and literally kill nodes and see what happens or how your system uh, uh, respond. Do all, go through all these like simulations. Um, that is uh, Chaos Monkey from, uh, from Netflix. Check it out, it's pretty interesting if you're running on uh, AWS. Scalability also is the ability to scale team. Um, in your hiring, make sure that you hire the best people. This is all stuff that everybody knows, but you are as strong as your weakest link. Um, you want to make sure that when you hire these people, they, from the get-go, they walk in and they have a machine. Uh, all of these set, the hardware is set up already for them to work. You can use tour, uh, uh, tools like uh, um, uh, vag uh, Vagrant and stuff, that they have proper access. Uh, make sure that you have a knowledge base. Just tell them what's the password for Git or where, how to get like an account. Um, your development process, make sure that it's something that can scale and it's agile. You have teams. If you want to scale, if you're a startup, and you want to become a, a big organization, you got to start thinking of that stuff early. If you happen to be the VP of engineering, you happen to be um, in a position when, um, of, uh, that, that you actually can, can impact uh, your organization in that level. But um, a good way to do it is actually organize people in these pools. You have like a pool of the engineers and pool of QA and a pool of uh, product owner and even a pool of architecture owners. And then you assemble these teams to work on particular like projects. You know, you pull in four developers, one QA, one architect, and one product uh, manager, and then throw out like a one sprint and then you do something with them. Uh, you keep your teams small. Um, and also you want to give them ownership, most importantly, to their DevOps. You, each one of those teams is responsible for not actually writing the code, testing the code, but actually deploying it to production, and you want to enable them, give them data, database access and whatever it is, and they're the ones that would babysit that particular piece of code until it graduates and becomes a part of the final production code. So the take home message, um, I'm probably running out of time. Right now I've actually, oh right, I have three minutes. But the take home message of this presentation is that make sure that you address these concerns as early as possible um, and plan for capacity early, um, design to scale from day one. Me just, they all, me just say, all right, instead of doing things this way, I'm going to spend an extra hour and do things like differently. Make sure that you actually sit down and then determine uh, how scalable is scalable for your own organization. You know, you can't just sit there and over-engineer a system that is capable of using, of being used by 300 million people, and your, you have, uh, and your product is one that is in language X that is only spoken by 200 people in the bush somewhere. So that doesn't make any sense. That would be just like overdoing it. Um, your scalability there is your ability to write a system that is able, uh, able to be evolved to be used by 300 people. Um, do not bite more than you can chew. Extremely important. Building scalable systems is a process. You will incur technical debt. In fact, you should incur technical debt. You don't walk in there and do Hadoop here and do this and do that. You just do things just little by little, you know, as long as it's done in a structured um, and uh, organized manner. You want to also commit to a roadmap around these bottlenecks. And most importantly, guided by planned, fe uh, the planned business feature. So you go and say, my CPU, my network, and my storage, uh, which one of these do I improve and make more scalable? That is to be gu guided by the next feature. If your next feature is some kind of weird query uh, that your business needs, um, so you might want to start thinking of actually doing some work and improving the data store uh, bottleneck uh, strategically. Right? So the, uh, more importantly, um, learn from other people's experiences. 
read the tech blog of Netflix and Twitter and all of these people uh, and learn from your own, own mis mistakes um, uh, more importantly. So take it slow and you'll, you'll get there. Um, this is the scream, the smiling scream, I found it online, but work smarter, not harder. You can't just do everything at once, but as long as you do it in a way that is gradual, and as long as you acknowledge your technical debt, yeah, that you'll be just fine. And thank you guys for being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference.